Good morning. So my name is Murray. Let me back up here. And we're going to dig into, once again, the gospel according to Luke in the New Testament. And we're journeying through this book. It's going to take us a few years, but we'll eventually uh, get through the entire pieces. We'll take some breaks in between. But we're, we reached Luke chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there's still a few Bibles, I think. Can't see for the light, but I uh, assume there maybe is a Bible or two left on the table. Yeah, just come down and grab one of those Bibles. Uh, you can use it just to follow along this morning if you want. Or if you don't own a Bible, then just take that Bible home with you. It's our gift to you. And we'd love for you to read this entire gospel account from Dr. Luke. Well, Temptation is the topic, really, of what we're going to look at today, and we've all faced it. And temptation, we could say, really is a ramp that the enemy has really uh, an attempt to, to get you off the road that God would actually have called you to be on. It's kind of like bait on a hook. The devil will use whatever bait is most enticing to you, whether that's food or sex or money, control, comfort, boyfriend, girlfriend, security, whatever. Just whatever would compel you to actually bite and then take that hook. And the devil is crafty, is clever, and the liar finds creative and subtle ways to bait that hook so that you actually will just focus on the bait, the good stuff, and not the hook. But... It comes from an enemy who wants to reel you in and devour you. Whereas Jesus, he wants you to see the hook because he's after our joy. Now, temptation itself is not a sin. The devil lies by telling us that if we're tempted, then we're already defeated. But that's actually not true because Jesus was tempted as we are and yet did not sin. So we want to get some help today from Luke chapter 4, where the devil comes to the Lord Jesus, and he's just going to bait the hook continually. He's going to use a whole variety of lures, lures that he also uses against us. And so, yeah, and often against us, it's quite successful. And because Jesus has been tempted, he's also compassionate. He's understanding then with us in our temptations. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, surely Jesus can't really understand temptation. I mean, he's, he's God. He's ne he, he never sinned. So I don't think he could really even understand how tempting that temptation really is. But he does understand. You see, first of all, because he set aside the use of his divine attributes, we see that Philippians chapter 2 tells us, to live fully as a man, a human, who had to depend then completely on the Holy Spirit and walk by faith, trusting his Father just like we do. And then secondly, let me ask you, is it harder to resist temptation or to give in? It's way harder to resist, right? It takes no effort just to give in. And since Jesus resisted all temptation then he actually understands the full weight of it more than I think you and I do, right? Because we often give in. We don't ever get to feel the full weight of it. Now, if you don't think that the temptation is real for him, I think you just really just need to go uh, to a future day later on here in Luke to the Garden of Gethsemane in the shadow of the cross and just see the depths of his battle against temptation. And just see there that it was real and it was difficult. And also see him win. Right? So let's look at this passage then to see Jesus do for us what we often failed to do. Here's our scripture, Luke chapter 4 then, the first 13 verses. Reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, 
to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Thanks, Peyton, for the reading of that scripture, and especially thank you for the last passage in chapter 3, the genealogies. You, got a, you weren't here, but you got a standing ovation for that one. Yeah, you got a standing ovation there. So let's pick it up. Verse 1, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, that's the Jordan River, and was led by the Spirit in wilderness. So Jesus goes right from his baptism, hair still damp, right? He was there identifying with sinners like you and like me, and now he goes right to the battlefield where he also identifies with us. At the end of chapter 3, right, Luke given us the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Adam because I think he wants us to see and make the connection that where Adam, our first father, fell to the temptation of the devil, Jesus now steps in to win for his people what Adam lost so that there would be a different ending to our story. So Jesus enters in where our first representative, Adam, left us. And he left us in the wilderness, no longer in paradise, right? We're now outside of the garden, right? This is not, we're not in the garden anymore, Toto. And so that's where we're left. And this wilderness is an area called Jezumon, which literally means the devastation. It's difficult to traverse. It's, it's got a harsh climate there. The conditions are very challenging. It was a horrible place to spend 40 days, six and a half weeks, alone with the devil. This is not some junior demon. This is El Diablo himself. And he's Jesus without food, without comfort, without any resources. Now, I can't imagine a worse situation. Because I hate being alone for long periods of time. I hate not eating, right? I, I hate being in the desert. I hate camping out. I hate being alone with the devil, right? But that's the situation. So verse 2, for 40 days being tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And I want to go, yeah, no kidding, Luke, right? I think that's a bit of an understatement, right? Some of you are hangry, you miss lunch, right? And then you excuse your grouchiness. But we're going to see that Jesus does not excuse responding poorly. And that's because he doesn't. He doesn't take the easy route. He doesn't just yield and just give in to his desires like we often do. Verse 3, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, first, let's notice the devil's real. But there's no red suit, no pitchfork in the description. See, we learned that the devil's not about scaring people, right? In fact, he actually comes pretending to be a friend. And he actually seeks to win your trust. And he tempts with words, with lies. He doesn't come with eerie music to make your head spin around, right? Have your eyes roll back into your head and puke green, right? Alcohol can do that, right? So, no, he is strategic, right? And he loves to tempt when you're tired, when you're lonely and isolated, and when you're hungry. And Jesus was experiencing all those things. So how does the devil start this first temptation? What's the word? If. And do you remember what God the Father had clearly said to Jesus at his baptism? You, well, you yeah, you can, you can cheat, you can look back, look back chapter 3. You are, 
Okay, we got to get this right, because if we can't start there, we're going to be off on the wrong foot right away. What did God the Father say to his son at the baptism? Chapter 3, look back. Voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son, right? And you am well pleased, right? So it's you are my beloved son. And now Satan's like, he comes and says, if you are the son of God. So listen, you can write this down. It's one of Satan's tactics. He puts question marks in your life where God has put periods. The devil comes like this caring, reasonable friend and says, come on, you're starving. You, you need calories, right? Your so-called father is all talk, right? You ask for food, he gives you a stone. Are you going to trust him? Come on, we all know what's best for you. We know what you need, and you need it now. Um, feed your appetite, right? Go to that porn site. Date that non-Christian. Satisfy that hunger, that desire. You need it. This is just natural for us as humans, right? It's just food for the belly. And as for God, are you sure he's good? Are you sure he loves you? I mean, just listen to your stomach growl. You're starving. He is not providing what you need. Your future is going to be pretty bleak if you're going to wait on him and do things his way. See, that's how the devil comes at you, right? But here's the big question. Will you listen to God's word or will your stomach's growling drown it out? Would you rather be fed or fathered? Will Jesus trust the heart of his father even when he doesn't provide the good things that he wants? And will you? And is there good reason that Jesus is starving and needs to walk through this wilderness? Is there a good reason for it? Or is it actually because God is not good? Satan's trying to get Jesus to satisfy his appetites in bread and not in God. And behind this temptation is if we just had bread, life would be all satisfying. Life would be good. And you can just fill in the blank for whatever bread in your life is. Maybe it's a girl or boy to love us. Maybe it's a political change. Maybe it's a career. Whatever you think you need to satisfy that hunger, that discontent in your soul. You thought if you only had that bread, you'd be satisfied. You'd be content. Trouble is that bread turns stale pretty quick. Some of you have dated stale bread, right? We see that behind the specifics of the bread, really it is a deeper identity issue. Are you really a beloved son? Like, are you sure he really loves you? Because, I mean, you're suffering. You're broke. You're hungry. You're lonely. It sure doesn't look like he loves you to me. See, Satan is a liar, and he often starts with a question like, did God really say? Because he wants you to put a question mark about your identity where Jesus, through the cross, put a period. And even if you maybe know, maybe you are convinced that God is a good father to his children, then the devil will actually tempt you to believe it's just not true of you. He'll tempt you to look at yourself, to look at your circumstances, and then say, you're obviously not one of his. Because the devil doesn't want you to find your identity and your joy in the gospel as a beloved child of God. He wants you to see, that's a, that's a very small thing. It's just, it's just not enough. And let's see how Jesus responds to this temptation then in verse 4. And Jesus answered him, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And so Jesus responds by quoting scripture, right, from Deuteronomy. In fact, all the scripture that Jesus is going to use, all the truth that he's going to use here against the temptations of the devil in this whole chapter, they're all from Deuteronomy. If all of human history hinged on your knowledge of Deuteronomy for victory, how would it go, right? 
due to what, due to where, you know? Uh, aren't you glad that Jesus from a young age, we saw that back in chapter two, that he was learning the heart of his father in the scriptures, including Deuteronomy. And aren't you glad that he read his Bible relationally to know God his father, to deepen his trust and love of him? And I think that Jesus quotes Deuteronomy because it was written by Moses for Israel in the wilderness after their failure in temptation. See, Jesus is the true and better Israel, the true and better offspring of Abraham who passed the test that Israel continually failed so that the world could actually finally receive the promised blessing of Abraham. Now, is it wrong to eat food after having nothing to eat for 40 days? No, it's not wrong, right? But the temptation is to love the gifts of God more than God himself and to, to trust in our own provision and our own timing as opposed to trust God to provide. See, bread is good, but it's not ultimate. My completeness, it's found in God. Not having my physical needs, my desires met. Jesus would rather be fathered than fed. He'd rather die than disobey and dishonor his father. And this is the same thirsty Jesus who stood at a well in John chapter 4. Speaking of living water that would quench a far deeper thirst of the soul to, this, to a woman, a Samaritan woman at the well, right? It's far superior, he was saying, to any water you can drink from this well, because the water you drink from this well, you're still going to thirst again. If Jesus turned the rocks to bread and then he ate, he'd still hunger again. The same is true with all our physical appetites. But God gives us himself, and his love satisfies forever. And not even death can take it away, but it'll actually deepen our satisfaction. So are you trying to live on bread alone? Because the devil wants you more focused on that bread in this life than the true and ultimate bread of life. And here's what Satan will do. He will attack your faith. He will stir up unbelief in your heart about the goodness of God and getting you to not trust his heart that he's actually showing us in the person of Jesus. The devil wants you focused on yourself and having pleasure now. Of course, he doesn't tell you, doesn't remind you how temporary it is, right? And he doesn't tell you about the hook that comes with it. The devil wants you to treat God like a genie, just to answer your wishes, right? To, re to relate to him as just a dispenser of stuff that you believe you need. And then when he doesn't come through, the devil will tell you, told you so, told you so. And then if he can, he'll even push you further. He'll push you to the point where your unbelief says, I don't even think God exists. See, the devil wants to reframe your whole worldview that God is not ultimate, he is not good, he is not trustworthy, or he is not enough. And then as a caring friend in the wilderness, the devil will try to convince you that obedience to God as father, following his word, is actually foolish, really archaic. And it's actually robbing you of, of happiness and satisfaction and life. So after this temptation, does the devil leave? No. It's, it's naive to think that once you say no to temptation, the devil's going to leave you alone. Just quote a verse. He'll flee. No. He just rebates the hook. And this time with a little prosperity teaching. Verse 5. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You know, look upon the glory of this, he says, right? The devil doesn't start with worship me. He starts with, look at how good this fruit is. It's desirable. And it's desirable to make you wise. It's satisfying. Gaze upon it. Think about it. Focus on it. Desire it. You need it. Verse 6, and said to him, 
This is still the devil talking. To you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it's been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. So this second temptation really is to get the kingdom without the cross. To get a crown without a cross. To get the end without the suffering as the means to that end. But a crossless Christianity is not Christianity at all. So here too we see that sin is connected to Satan worship. And that's the hook that's under the bait. Trust and obedience, it's a worship issue. And to choose sin is to worship the devil. And I've done it, and so have you. And the devil is claiming that the rule of this world was then passed on to him by Adam when he, as God's vice regent of the world, Adam chose to submit to and follow the serpent and trust his word over God's word, thus making the devil the ruler of this world. And so he becomes then the ruler of that which Adam was supposed to have dominion over. And now, now, having Jesus being granted authority of the kingdom on earth, I think that's certainly a good thing, right? But the devil was offering it to him now as opposed to waiting for God's timing and, more importantly, opposed to God's way. And that is sin. And it'll eventually wreck everything, ultimately. So the devil will tempt by enticing to get to a good and legitimate end through compromise, as opposed to waiting upon the Lord and trusting Him, because that's going to demand patience and potential suffering. So why wait until marriage? I mean, come on, we love each other. We're going to be married soon anyway. And hey, it, it's way cheaper if we just move in together or... Why wait to save up before purchasing this item? We, we could get it right now by going into debt. I mean, why would God have created credit cards and line of credit, right? If it wasn't for us to buy now. Or I could avoid suffering if I just compromise a little in this area. You know, wouldn't you love a bigger ministry, a greater influence, a bigger profit, right? Do we want a crossless Christianity as well? I mean, did Jesus really say, take up your cross and follow me? Verse 8, and Jesus answered him, it is written. Is that starting to sound familiar? It's a familiar refrain we're getting, right? You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Where's that verse come from? Deuteronomy. Ah, you're listening. Yeah. But Jesus just refuses to go around God's plan. He is committed to the written word of God, which is God's revealed will to us, and he worships and trusts and loves God, and he's my hero. So surely now the devil will leave him alone, right? Nope. He baits the hook again, right? This time, the devil takes out his well-used Bible. He loves himself some good religion and spirituality. After all, he is a spiritual being. And in this temptation, then, the devil is going to put some religious bait, some spirituality on the hook. You see, a lot of what is spiritual is not of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, and he, that's the devil, took him, that's Jesus, to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Wow, the devil can perform miracles and sweeps him up to the top of the temple. And he said to him, if, if you are the son of God, notice that refrain, attacking the identity, throw yourself down from here. For it is written. Oh, it is written, right? The devil sounds a lot like Jesus here, right? But don't confuse the two. The devil quotes the Bible. Here he's quoting from Psalm 91. But he frames it in, its, in his own context. He, he, I mean, there's nothing like a, a good proof text to establish a lie. One of his greatest temptations is the almost truth. 
the almost truth. The devil knows the Bible. He's written best-selling Christian books. He speaks at popular Christian conferences. He and the demons, they have Bible studies in their community group as they plan how they can use and twist the Scripture to lead us astray. Like, hey, we can, we can explain that truth away. We'll just say it was just for the culture back then. And, and, and then we can build up their pride by telling them how advanced they are now. And, and, and we can pluck this verse from its context and make it pretty much anything we want. And let's get them reading their Bible, not as a revelation of Jesus, but as if it's all about them and what they must do. Because then that'll either crush them in despair or puff them up with pride and self-righteousness and either one will work. So the devil here, he quotes from Psalm 91. He says, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, the full context of Psalm 91 which is always important to make sure you know, it's actually about trusting and obeying God, right? It's doing what's right no matter the cost. So I hope that you know that just because someone uses Bible verses does not mean they're actually teaching truth from God. The devil frames his story first, and then he quotes a verse that seems to back up his narrative. And in this case, he focuses on the victory, and he ignores the suffering. He ignores the obedience. And he can preach health, wealth, and prosperity with the best of them. So this third temptation is to interpret God's word through your circumstances and feelings, through the lens of culture, rather than having God's word interpret your circumstances. Yeah, because the devil's basically saying, if God loved you, then you wouldn't get hurt. It wouldn't have to be this hard. If there is a God, and he is good, and he is caring, then you wouldn't be suffering. In fact, you wouldn't even stub your toe. Right? The verse he quotes. Verse 12, and Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Quoting again from Deuteronomy, right? So why? Why do you not put the Lord God to the test? Because he already had God's word that he was his beloved son. He already had that. He already had the favor of God based on God's word, right? So he didn't need to look to his circumstances to determine if he was loved or if he was favored. He didn't judge God's word but rather God's word judges and, tr and really tests everything else as to its rightness and wrongness, to whether it is good or evil. Does God love you? Have you ever doubted it? <laughs> right? And maybe probably not that he even loves others. But you? Does he really love you? Yeah, me too. I've doubted that too. So what do you do to be certain of that love? Well, you behold the God revealed in the Scriptures, in the person of Jesus. Is not the cross enough for you? The, the enemy wants you to undervalue what you actually have in Jesus. Verse 13, it says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So here the devil slinks away, but he's going to watch, and he's just going to be looking for another opportune time. And that's why we don't just overcome temptation one day and then think we're done. Now, did you notice that really in every one of these temptations that the devil aims to point you away from suffering, away from hard things, and just to immediate comfort, right? God wouldn't want you hungry, right? I'll give you all the power on earth. Right now, I'll give you the kingdom, and you can avoid the cross. In fact, in the last temptation, right, he tells Jesus, if you're the son of God, I mean, your feet shouldn't even bleed. The devil was tempting Jesus to unbelief, 
in saying, if God the Father truly loved you, nothing bad would ever happen to you. You wouldn't suffer and die. Even if you threw yourself off the roof of the temple, he would send his angels to catch you. And the fact that you won't jump is proof that you don't really believe it. Deep down, you know it's not true. Otherwise, you'd jump. See what he's doing? Well, what does this 40 days of temptation in the wilderness, this being hungry, this thirst, remind you of? Well, for me, it's Israel's 40 years in the wilderness where they were tempted and they failed. And now the true Israel, the true prince of God, he overcomes the enemy and he passes the test. So where Israel doubted and rebelled, Jesus trusted and obeyed fully. And I think we're meant to also think all the way back to the garden, right? That's why the genealogy was there, right? Where the first Adam, the head of the human race, he too is tempted by the devil. And the devil tempts him to doubt God's word. You know, did God really say? And he offers him something good to eat. The first Adam was really set up to pass the test. I mean, think about it, because he was not in a wilderness, right? He had all his needs met. He dwelt very comfortably in paradise with an abundance of food. He needed nothing. In fact, he had a full tummy when he was tempted to eat. The first Adam was really set up to pass the test. Jesus, he had an empty stomach, and he was in a desert, and he had nothing. Now, Adam, he didn't need to test God to see if he was loved and to see if God really cared, because the proof of it was all around him. It was all around him every moment of every day in just the lavishness, in the abundance, in the garden in Eden. Jesus was deprived of everything. He had every reason to doubt God his Father. Adam, he had a companion, a beautiful wife by his side. God himself, in his presence, walked with him uh, in the cool of the evening every night. Jesus was single, all alone, in the wilderness. I tell you, Adam was set up for success. Jesus was set up to fail. Yet Adam fell. And Jesus didn't. Jesus is the second and better Adam. And the devil just throws everything he has at Jesus, and Jesus wins. And he did it for us. Yeah. And he wins not by claiming his rightful throne or simply restoring justice or by giving an example for us to emulate, but actually by substituting for us. You see, not only did Jesus succeed where Adam failed in paradise and where Israel failed in the wilderness, but he succeeded where you and I have failed. See, I've failed and succumbed to a whole lot of temptations. And I've bought into many a lie. But I'm treated by God as if I responded to every temptation as Jesus does here in this passage. Jesus, as our head, represents us, his people, his church, and his righteous life is imputed to us, and his atoning death is imputed to us. And in this temptation, in this test, we get to see the glory of Jesus and how he is the perfect, victorious Savior that we need. He is the perfect, unblemished, spotless Lamb of God. He is the only one who could substitute himself for us. And Jesus is tested, yet he does not sin, and his victory is put to our account. Like, we're clothed with his righteousness, and he brings all he represents, all who had fallen in the wilderness, up out of sin and darkness, and up into the light, into a restored relationship with God, his Father, now our Father. And this grace just causes our hearts to melt and just love him. And then we want to trust the word and obey him and overcome temptation because we want him to be honored and we want his glory.
Now, Jesus had two weapons, which he also gives us access to. The first weapon is the word of God. Satan tries to get Jesus to doubt God's word, and Jesus quotes the truth of God's word right back in Satan's face. This is not like throwing an incantation at Satan, right, to make him go away, right? In Jesus' name, be gone, right? The, the sons of Sceva, Acts, was it Acts chapter 19, somewhere in there, middle of Acts somewhere, you got these seven brothers going against one demon. Now, I don't know a lot about fighting, but if you leave the fight and you don't have your pants on anymore, right, you lost, and so these seven sons of Sceva, they're heading out there, and they're now naked heading away, and uh, they lost because they were simply trying to use, in Jesus' name, like a magical incantation to fight the devil. That's not what it's about. This is not some Harry Potter duel, right, where Satan, bam, throws a temptation, right, and you ward it off going, oh, no, you don't, First Peter 3, 8, bam. You know, and, and then it just counters Satan's power, right? And then you do battle back and forth with Satan, right? And then the one who knows the most scripture text wins. Satan always knows more verses than you. And you can't outsmart him by going all awana on him, right? With all your memory verses, right? That's not how Jesus uses scripture, Jesus recalls the knowledge of who God is, the knowledge of who his father actually is, and God's declaration about how he feels about him. The devil says, if you're the son of God, and points him to all the circumstances, tempting him to doubt his identity, right? See, Satan is out to get you to doubt God's declaration of you to doubt your gospel identity. See, Satan's main work is not to get you to foam at the mouth, levitate over your bed, and, and, and play on a Ouija board. He's actually out you to get to doubt the gospel and the identity that's ours in Jesus. He's out to get us to not be confident in our Father's love. He wants us to question and doubt God's character and his approval of us in Jesus. He wants us to focus on what we have done to either stir up shame for our failure or to lift up our pride and stoke that, right, for our successes. The scriptures are a window into reality to see God for who he really is by beholding Jesus. And then we get to see the universe rightly to know where everything is headed, you don't overcome lust by simply memorizing verses about lust, right? And then you're armed for the next temptation because it's not incantations. It's not just lobbing out scripture verses like darts against the enemy. It's a relationship of love and trust with the living and all-powerful God in and through Jesus. That's what the scripture leads us into right? It's like what we see with Jesus and his father. And then the second weapon is the spirit of God, right? That's relational. In the first verse, chapter four, right? We're told Jesus was filled with the spirit. Well, what does that mean? Wasn't he God? But Jesus at this point didn't lean into his divinity. He was fully God, yes, but he was fully man, and as a man, he drew then from the same resources that you and I draw from, the word and the spirit. It was relationship with the God who was present with him, even though he couldn't see him like a dove anymore. If Jesus, the man, needed the spirit of God to overcome Satan, then so do you and I. And the spirit is driving us to Jesus to deepen our relationship with God, who is our Abba. And the Spirit of God and the Word of God, they always go together. Some have tried to use Scripture apart from the Spirit. You get this dry legalism. And others try to look to the Spirit apart from the Scripture. We need to avoid both ditches. The Spirit inspired the Scriptures and uses that Word to speak to us and direct us and move us to behold Jesus and to re-believe the gospel so that we would love him more and more and stand in that relationship that he has purchased for us. And the Spirit through the Word reveals to us the plan of God, the good news story, where the only selfless man in all of history didn't come to take, but actually laid down his life for the selfish ones. 
because he loves us and because he knows we need to be fathered. See, grace could not bypass the cross. The cross of Jesus purchased the grace that we receive and in which we stand. And the same Jesus is fighting for us and with us. And we need both the truth and the love of God pressed into our hearts. Because Satan's ultimate temptation, I mean, it comes against Jesus. It comes to its head in the Garden of Gethsemane. And again, Jesus overcomes and he sets his face like a flint and he goes to the cross. And Jesus here in Luke 4 shows it that he is the conqueror who's able to overcome temptation. And not only that, he is the one who will crush the serpent's head. Because that's what the rest of Psalm 91 goes on to say. But the devil left that out. He didn't give you the full context. Context is everything. Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses and in our temptations. But you know what? So can I. But I do it as a fellow struggler. I do it as a sinner and a failure. But Jesus does it as a high priest who not only can sympathize with us in experiential understanding, but he also can save us when we fail and fall in those temptations. So he's not just sympathetic. He's a savior. And because of him, I can do more now than just sympathize with you. I can also point you to the victorious and perfect Savior. So I want to every day just invite you to Jesus. Because Jesus passed the test so that even when we fail, we pass. I'm glad there's some things that you can't do without passing a test. Really. Like driving. You know? I am glad. The sidewalks are dangerous enough already. Right? Or surgery. Right? Uh, I'm glad my surgeon, I'm glad my dentist had to pass personally. They had to pass a test, and I'm glad for that. I'm just glad that being a Christian isn't one of those things because Jesus passed the test for you and for me. Let's pray. Lord, I, I really think the biggest point that we should be getting from this passage is that there is no one like you, Jesus. You never failed. You never will. You never compromised. You never disobeyed the will of your Father. You don't love anything more than your Father and the Spirit. You were tired and lonely and hungry, and you overcame every single temptation. And because you overcame every temptation for us, you were able to become the perfect sacrifice for us. And now because of the cross, when we fall in temptation, we get to get back up and run to your throne of grace all the times the devil has bested me, do not condemn me. And this kind of love strengthens us to know who we are so that we don't so easily fall anymore. Because it is written that we are loved by you and the truth of that kind of love we see in the scriptures, it sets us free. Not only did the Father not send in angels to rescue you from that cross, so that your foot would not bleed. No, your blood was poured out for a failure like me that your successes could be gifted as mine. I love you. Father, help us see the treasure that we've been granted in Jesus just more and more so that we not only stand against the devil's lies and temptations, but he might be trampled right under our feet as well because of you. It's in Jesus' name we are loved, and we pray, amen.